for now, the most useful lead in the search for the missing airliner has been those satellite images of possible debris. But nothing has been confirmed yet. And even as the hunt continues, people around the globe are trying to do their share to help aid in the search by utilizing technology. NewsHour science correspondent Miles O'Brien has our report. It's interesting because we don't even know where the haystack is. It could be here, it could be here, it could be here. And so there's all these different places to look. This is what spare time looks like for Jenny Peterson these days. It makes it seem like a game. And for being a former gamer, it, it's almost like you're on a quest. She's on a quest to find that missing Malaysian airliner without ever leaving her home in the Washington, D.C. area. People have also found whales. I found a whale. I don't want to say it's fun. It is kind of fun to get new pictures every day because you don't know what will be there. You just want to keep going and uncover the whole picture. It's like putting together a puzzle. She is one of more than three million people who have volunteered their time to pour over satellite imagery of the search areas to see if there is anything unusual, any sign of the missing Boeing 777. You want to be able to do something, but you can't because you're not in that line of work, you're across the world, you know, you have family or whatever, tiny down, you can't just, you know, up and leave and volunteer for the Red Cross. This is something that we can do. Jenny is searching on the Tomnod site run by Digital Globe. This is the company that released these images of debris in the Indian Ocean that are the current focus of the search, although they were not the fruits of the crowdsourcing campaign. The Colorado company acquires and sells imagery captured by a fleet of five satellites in polar orbits. When they pass over the region, those satellites, the most powerful available outside the classified world, are now focused on the huge area where they are searching for the missing airplane. They release the images on the website as quickly as they can, so the crowd can use its many hands to make light work. So far, we've received millions of tags from millions of users. Anything you can use satellite imagery for crowdsourcing just makes it better. Luke Barrington is senior manager of geospatial big data at Digital Globe. He explains how the search works. If you see anything interesting, if you see something that might be evidence of the crash or of wreckage or of a life raft or of an oil slick or anything that could be useful, you simply click on it in your web browser and that tag gets recorded. And what we find is if you agree with, you know, 10 or 100 other people who have all independently seen that same location in their own web browser, we start to identify these locations of consensus. And that's where the real information comes out. That's the wisdom of the crowd. That's crowdsourcing. Once the crowd agrees, the object in question is passed along to the real experts who can determine if it is something that can be eliminated or an urgent destination for search and rescue aircraft. This crowdsourced search for the Malaysian airliner is just the latest manifestation of a powerful mix of space, computer, and mobile technology coupled with social networking and the plain old human desire to help others in need. So we stop this nonsense of we wait for the government to help, right? This fire truck approach to quickly putting out the fires. Why don't we become citizen firefighters ourselves? Patrick Meyer had that epiphany in the immediate wake of the Haiti earthquake of 2010. At the time, working on an international affairs PhD at Tufts University, he gathered some friends together in his living room to brainstorm ways to harness the information generated through social networking in the wake of the disaster so that the humanitarian response will be more effective. He is an early and leading advocate of the power of crowdsourced mapping. Humanitarian professionals, paid professionals, cannot be everywhere at the same time. But the crowd can. The crowd is always there, and the crowd has agency, and they're going to respond a lot faster. You're getting real-time information from sort of a bird's-eye view angle of who's been affected, how badly, and where. So a lot of humanitarian organizations, when you start talking to them about, hey, it's like having your own helicopter, get it a bit more about what the added value uh, might be. Even so, many humanitarian organizations were initially skeptical of Patrick and his band of enthusiastic, young, technologically savvy friends. But over time, the United Nations, the Red Cross, and other large humanitarian organizations became true believers. The UN has created something called the Digital Humanitarian Network to help capture all the urgent tweets and texts, map them, and try to connect the pleas for help with someone who can. You have this big data, quote-unquote, and what we're all realizing 
you know, humanitarians, technologists like is the overflow of information generated during disasters can be as paralyzing to humanitarian response as the, as the absence of information. And they enlist the crowd to analyze the data to make sense of all of the information being collected. And the best way to visualize that is you imagine a haystack that's been put together in a square form, in a cube, right? And you basically then slice up the haystack in tiny little cubes, and every volunteer takes care of their little part of the haystack, and they all do it at the same time. That's far more, far more efficient. The digital humanitarian network was last mobilized in the Philippines in the wake of Typhoon Haiyan. Maning Sambal was a volunteer with OpenStreetMap, an open source collaboration that is the Wikipedia of mapping. We've asked uh, people all over the world to trace uh, features, map, map, map features uh, using satellite imagery. More than 1,600 volunteers provided four and three quarter million updates to maps of the Tacloban region in less than a month. The volunteers looked at commercial satellite imagery captured after the storm by Digital Globe and traced out the footprints of homes and buildings to give relief workers maps that accurately reflected their devastated surroundings. That it, it's the most comprehensive map they, they were able to, to see um, a, a week after um, uh, the, the typhoon. There are, there are other maps that's there in, in, on the ground, but the difference is that we have this detail on the street level. But does it work? Does it really save lives? Relief workers in the Philippines or in Haiti would tell you yes. And at Digital Globe, they claim some success as well, though not always with a happy ending. They instigated a crowdsourced search for two lost hikers in the Peruvian Andes in 2012. The crowd found tracks that led to the hikers, but unfortunately, they were already dead. Mostly, crowdsourcing looks like this, frame after frame of nothing. But even nothing can be something. The idea that there is value in documenting that a particular image has nothing special in it is what drives people like Jenny Peterson to keep looking at swaths of the Indian Ocean night after night. Even if you can't say, oh, I found something, finding nothing is still finding something. You know that you don't have to expend resources to search in that area when you don't see anything there. And if I can help eliminate areas to search and have, let the let them focus on the areas that are of interest, then great, I'm, I'm good with looking at nothing, if that can help them out. While the cartographers of the crowd are constantly looking for ways to automate some of this painstaking work, this is one innovation that is enabled by technology, but driven by the most amazing computer of all, the one that sits behind our discerning eyes. And Miles joins me now. Miles, so this goes on. It is an amazing thing to think people all over the world are doing this. Yes, you can join right now if you want, Judy, and be a part of the search. What, so, so back to that search. Uh, yes, we know there's bad weather. Yes, we know it's far away from Australia where they're looking. But why is this so hard? It's, it's hard because we just have a paucity of data. You know, it's hard to imagine in the 21st century that an airliner with all the electronics and all the technology we have could go missing with so little, you know, you would think at least a trail of electronic breadcrumbs would exist, and it doesn't. And so it, there's any number of directions still that it could have flown. It's still not guaranteed that it's in that very spot. That, that wreckage that we saw in the piece and that has been released by Australia might, that might just be debris, just plain old debris. There's plenty of it in the ocean. We know about that. So there, it's, to say it's a needle in a haystack is an understatement, I think. So the pings that this satellite picked up could have been from something else. It could be anything. I mean, when you think about that giant hunk of plastic out in the Pacific, that gives you an idea of the kinds of things it could be seeing. You, you've talked, Miles, about the, the, the Malaysian air, uh, airlines decided not to invest in a, in a communication system that would have sent more data back to home base. Explain what that is and why that would have made well, a difference. Well, you know, uh, we're all familiar, of course, with the, the radio transmissions that the, the crew engages in with the air traffic control. But in addition, there's a couple other channels of, of communication on modern airliner, and one of them is this device called ACARS. It's just a fancy acronym for kind of a f almost fax machine meets email kind of thing, where it, it spits out uh, a little bit of information about the airplane on a routine basis. 
In this case, it was not as frequent as it was in the case of, if you'll recall, the Air France flight that went missing over the mid-Atlantic regions a few years ago. That had the, the upgraded ACARS with an app on it, which actually provided much more information, much more frequently, and aided the searchers, because they knew better where it was and what the condition of that aircraft was. In this case, they didn't have it, and it really is a very inexpensive thing to add on. It's like about $10 per flight. So a lot more info. We'd be we'd have a lot more information. We'd know added. much better where what direction that plane was in. So final analysis: Where is the greatest hope for for finding out what happened? Well, here? they're going to need a little bit of luck. I think they're going to need some luck with the weather. Uh, let's hope that, frankly, that that uh, what those satellites saw were in fact pieces of the aircraft, because that that gives them something to go on. Without any debris, there's really very little chance that they'll find this. It's a big ocean and a big planet, and you just can't go in every which way trying to find. Uh, a potential debris pattern. So, uh, you know, let's hope for some good weather for starters. Miles O'Brien, thank you right, very much. Welcome. Great to have you with us.